what do you want to say? Like the whole is greater than sort of any one individual, right? Mm-hmm. That you're, you're generating a higher intelligence is, and when you say that, do you mean like the collective intelligence of the group? Yes. Like what, what exactly do you mean by intelligence? Um, well, yeah, it depends on how you measure it. It very much depends on how you measure it. So there's some wonderful studies that have been conducted by Anita Woolley, uh, who's in America, but also with Thomas Malone um, at MIT. Mm-hmm. And they are looking at groups of people that are working together to try and solve a problem. So they're innovating and problem solving together. And what So they're looking at that type of intelligence. And what they found is that there's a really robust predictor for how well a group will do in terms of solving a problem. So in order to solve a problem, you've got to see the problem accurately. You've got to come up with a creative way of working to solve that problem. Um, And you've got to innovate as well. Uh, And you've got to be able to communicate with each other in order to harvest all of that information, right? Is this like a perceptual issue? Like the more people you have, the more the better you can perceive reality? So part of it, so exactly, yeah. So when we're talking about group work, yeah, so part of it, a big part of it is a perceptual problem. And so what you see time and time again is that when you bring a group of people together, they are more likely to perceive the environment in a more accurate way. So they're seeing the real world. Because our brains, um, well, our, our senses, um, each one of us is actually bringing in something in the region of 11 million bytes of data per second through our senses. Wow. And our brain is only consciously aware of aware of around 40 to 50 bytes a second. So that's a minuscule proportion, right? So mm-hmm. each one of us is focusing in on a very small amount of data from the outside world. But when you bring together a group of people, you can actually start to cancel out that bias or kind of shortcuts in information processing that each one individual person is making so that you're more likely to see the real picture, the real reflection of the situation. So is this a, is this a matter of just number of inputs? Like the more people I have working on a particular problem, the better solution w- will come out on the other side? That can help, but actually, so going back to Anita, stu- um, Anita Woolley's study with Thomas Malone, actually the biggest predicting factor for how a group could problem solve um, their way out of an, an, an issue together was um, gender ratio. So the Oh, high- fascinating. Hey, can you tease that apart for me? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually the higher the number of females within the group, the more successful that group would be. And that's not because females were inherently more intelligent. So they also took the IQ scores of the individual members of the group, and that wasn't linked, actually, remarkably, to how well the group would do. So independent of IQ. This is independent of IQ. Yeah, yeah, it was actually the gender ratio was the biggest predicting factor for how well that group would do. And that was because females are much more likely to turn take. So they listen to other members of the group. They ensure that there isn't dominance dynamics so that one person creates an echo-like, clone-like kind, mm. of, um, kind of echo chamber. Right. Um, actually, what happens is that the greater number of females within the group, the more turn-taking, the more listening there was. And so therefore, they were able to get towards a more representative view of the problem and then harness that brain power that was on offer in terms of innovating and problem solving their way out of the issue. Is, is, that, um, is that finding just across groups or are there particular, um, let's say, types of problems or maybe workplaces or activities where um, that, that um, gender ratio difference is, is better seen? Like, I'm not sure what the study, what the, the task was that they were... So it was, it was a number of different problem-solving tasks. Oh, a number of different problem Yeah, yeah, it was a number tasks. of different problem solving and it was the most robust factor. So, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So now it's not thought, it's not that, you know, males are inherently not capable of listening and turn-taking, sure. although actually, and I spoke to Anita Woolley and she says that it might be linked to testosterone levels. She, right. there, there's some indication, but actually it's thought it's probably more to do with, with a cultural um, kind of expectation that boys from a young age in certain cultures aren't taught that actually listening and turn taking is a really important skill. So in, in a lot of cultures, there's this idea that hierarchy, competition, being the loudest in the room, being, you know, the most dominant in the room is the, is the best 
well, actually, that's not going to be um, helpful as we need to problem solve uh, and, and our way out of challenges like climate change, for example, or the number of issues that are pressing humanity at the moment. Fair. So are, are these like, um, I, I just want to understand this correctly, because I, I do think there, there might be, there, there's definitely merit to like hierarchical organizations, like any, any company sort of operates in a, in a hierarchical fashion, right? So when you're talking about these groups succeeding preferentially at problem solving, is it like, um, like you mentioned climate change. So I would say like climate change is probably like more of like a conceptual issue. And then once you, once you've identified solutions, then you can go and implement the solutions. And then maybe when you're implementing a solution, you would need like a chain of command or something like that, just Mm. to go and to get things on the ground. But do you, do you mean in the sense that, um, uh, let's go back to the climate change example. Um, like we're kind of throwing our hands up, like what do we do? Yeah. And versus all, all of us just sort of screaming at each other, um, taking the time to listen, um, which, which it, so, so yeah. There's a chapter that also talks about leadership and you're right. Okay. Leadership is essential, I believe. Right, right, right. You know, right, right. but when we look to nature, for example, you can see that leadership is very transitory and that seems to work very well. And also the role of a transformational leader, which has been, again, linked to group success. Mm. Transformational leaders generally see their role as being able to facilitate communication and extract information from the individual um, members of the team and then follow advice from the different members of the team that are offering their expertise. So when you look look at a group, basically the way that you can help maximize the success of a group is to ensure A, that you're recruiting the right team so that you've got genetic and experience diversity within the individual members of the team. B, you make sure that they've got um, clearly delineated um, areas of expertise. So they feel confident bringing forward their ideas and what they have to offer within their own area of expertise. Mm. You also make sure that they can communicate freely and they are confident at doing that, but they also um, value listening and silence in some ways and periods for reflection. Um, And transformational leaders can help with that process by ensuring that you can access all of the information that's available within those teams. Right, that, that, and then in order to make some of the difficult decisions on how you're going to proceed forward, that's that's very congruent with um, with the thinking of I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Franz De Wallace, primatologist at Emory. Um, anyways, he studies sort of hierarchies in chimpanzees, and mm-hmm. he he's, he makes your exact point where he says that the most uh, efficacious leaders and the most long lasting leaders are not the the tyrants that come and just bully everyone and like make everyone submit to them. It's effectively the people that can can create harmony among among the troop. And, exactly. And yeah. sort of make sure everyone's opinion was was heard and they they felt seen. And and this is this isn't like a primate community. Yeah. So if we bring that one level up to let's let's say humans and like human problems, um I, I can see how that makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. And he 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 ran a similar study to the one you're citing where he um he, he was assessing surgery outcomes on surgical teams and surgery is a, a very male dominated uh, industry. And he, he came out with the same, the same finding that the second you introduce females into the mix, the outcomes were better. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think that's, that's very consistent with, um, with sort of some of the work that you're citing. Mm. 